Hello again viewers, welcome back, and today will be my first debunk video. In my last video, I recall that I was challenged by a creationist to watch a YouTube video about creationism titled Evolutionless, episode 25, Animals Defy Evolution. Well, I watched that video, did not learn anything, and got the idea to debunk the series that video is in, the first of which is titled Evolutionless, episode 1, introduction, chapter 1. In total, there are 37 videos in that series, but I'll probably not debunk each one consecutively. Instead, I might debunk a few and turn my attention to something else for a video. Anyway, let's take a look at the first video in the Evolutionless series. Okay, obviously evolutionary biologists, whom this video calls evolutionists, that should be plural, aren't the ones making up pointless lies or attempting to deceive anyone. The point of biology is to learn how nature operates, and it appears that nature changes over time through the process of evolution, which can be defined as a change in the genes of a population over time. Clearly, if this or any of the following videos in this series could or did debunk evolution, then they would win the Nobel Prize. They wouldn't have just a few hundred views. It has been said that ideas have consequences. That is so true as we'll see in this program. We're being told today that life is just the product of time and chance and random forces. Well, if we've just evolved from the primeval slime, then humanity sinks in significance. Darwin's second major book was rightly titled The Descent of Man. Wrong. Nature isn't simply random forces. That is, gravity, the strong, weak, and electromagnetic forces aren't fluctuating randomly on Earth. Rather, they are set in our universe. I'm not going into the whole anthropic argument here, as I'm sure the author of this video will mention it later. Likewise, natural selection is very non-random, choosing only those genes that will ensure the survival of a population. If the genes of a population do not allow survival, then the population dies out. This isn't randomness, it's how we know nature works. If you don't believe me, then you can perform the experiment for yourself. When I was in high school, my biology class did an experiment in which we put brine shrimp in waters of different sailing levels, so we could see in which level the shrimp survived best. As expected, they didn't survive equally in the waters, and we, as a class, were able to determine the best salinity for brine shrimp, that is, the saline level that allowed the most brine shrimp to live. Nature is the same way. Over time, organisms adapt to biotic and abiotic environmental factors through natural selection, or they die out. Again, this isn't random. Third, we haven't just evolved from the primeval slime, as he put it. Life has existed on Earth for about 3.8 billion years. Eukaryotic organisms, those of the centralized nucleus in their cells, have existed for about 2.1 billion years. Animals, about 650 million years. Vertebrates, about 525. Mammals, about 180. Placental mammals, about 90. Primates, about 65. Apes, about 18 million years. And humans, about 250,000 years. This guy's problem with evolution seems not to be with the evidence that supports it, but his own ego, feeling that he's insignificant if he wasn't specially created by a magical entity. Now, I've never read The Descent of Man. I've only read Origin of Species. But a quick look at the Wikipedia article for it shows nothing about making humans insignificant. Rather, the article says Darwin applied evolution to humans in detailed sexual selection because the other half of the title of The Descent of Man is And Selection in Relation to Sex, which the author of this video probably didn't read. Whatever descent means, I don't believe Darwin intended for it to mean that human dignity would descend because we're related to all other organisms on Earth. That doesn't make any sense. For man was no longer viewed as a little lower than the angels, but rather a little higher than the apes. Sorry, we were never related to angels in the first place, so I don't really think that matters. Next, we're not higher or better than any other apes. We're just differently evolved. We're not the pinnacle or zenith of evolution, just a byproduct. The only way to deny that we're related to apes in modern times is simply to illogically ignore the facts. What Darwin theorized about biology was applied by later thinkers to society, economics, and government, with devastating consequences. Darwin never advocated for social Darwinism or the belief that natural selection would sort out the fittest humans. Philosopher Herbert Spencer took the implication of natural selection on other organisms and applied that to humans, so neither evolution nor Darwin is at fault here. That's very dishonest to say an idea isn't logical because someone else used it for the wrong reasons.
The fact that this video says evolution is, quote, just a theory, shows that they, as I said in the first video, have no idea what a theory, hypothesis, or scientific law is. Second, evolution continues to exist because it is supported by all the facts of biology. There isn't one fact that runs counter to evolution, and creationism is the one, instead, that still exists for ideological reasons. I don't know what any of these quotes have to do with evolution. However, I did look up the Telegraph article about naturalist David Attenborough titled Humans Are Plague on Earth. Simply reading the article shows that he's completely right, and contrary to what this video is trying to insinuate, he doesn't advocate the genocide of humans. Instead, he correctly points out that if human population isn't limited in the future, then we'll consume all our resources and famine and disease will take over. This isn't a new idea. It was first, as far as I know, hit upon by clergyman Thomas Malthus, who lived from 1766 to 1834. So the concept predates both Darwin and evolution and was figured out by a creationist. He realized that there is a point in which a population will, if not regulated, consume all its resources, which humanity will do if we continue to grow exponentially. This quote is partially correct, although I'm cautious about using the term advanced because it gives people the wrong impression. There are, for example, advanced aves, which are birds that unconsciously evolved away the dinosaurian bony tail, but they aren't, quote, better than birds with the dinosaurian tail. We did, however, develop differently from other organisms. That's why we get our own special branch on the tree of life. Logically, the orcas themselves are not suing for their own freedom, and I think the point of showing these pictures is to somehow imply that evolution is responsible for people being environmentally conscious. I think this quote is supposed to stir up an emotional response to the idea that we aren't separated from all other organisms by some magic line. The reason this quote will only elicit an emotional response is there isn't a scientific argument against the fact that we are animals. Correct for once, it is very important to know the position of the theory of evolution by natural selection in science, and the position is that it's an exceptionally well-supported theory, probably one of the most substantiated in all of science. Although, I don't particularly like using the word Darwinism because it has a range of meanings, not all of which are scientific, especially when it's used by people who have no understanding of evolution. Now, for the two sentences, they're both flat out wrong. No credible scientist uses the phrase, quote, historical science. In fact, I've never heard the phrase used in any science class I've ever taken, and by the way, I'm a biology major. Second. While it is possible to make evolution a philosophy, like social Darwinism, that isn't its application in science. Saying that it is proves again that the person who made this video has no idea what evolution is. See, the, the problem is, is they've accepted certain explanations of the facts that we observed exactly. as if yeah. they were observations themselves. Like they're saying, yes. well, we've observed millions of years. Well, no, you haven't. Yeah. You're, you're observing facts and interpreting them that yeah. way, right? And there are two types of science, and we've yep. talked about this, this many, many times. There's operational science, and that has to do with making direct observations. And right. you can observe things happening in the present, see the results in real time, and then there's historical science, and that's about things in the past. Right. And uh, uh, where, where people make guesses about what happened in the past to explain what they're observing today. Right. Those are two different distinctions that really need to be made. First, no sane person is claiming to have observed millions of years, so I don't know who they're talking about. Second, no scientist is claiming that there are two types of science, historical and observational or operational. I only hear this claim on creationist websites. Imagine that. The reason this dichotomy doesn't make sense is, by definition, all science is observational. To do science, you must have an observation to begin with. Generally, creationist websites also claim that historical science is just left to the interpretation of the scientist, as though the facts of the matter have no bearing on the situation whatsoever. Do you understand the difference now? I mean, if I said, 
you know, figure out what chemicals are in, in, in this solution of water. What, what type of science would, would we use? Operational or historical? That would be operational. Right, because and I can do the experiment in the present, I can observe the results in real time. Yeah, and you discover that it's coke, not water. <laughs> <laughs> you got to stay awake somehow. So, okay. Uh, what about uh, if we said, how did the peacock get its feathers? Well, operation or hist uh, Operational or historical? And it obviously be historical. Yes, historical. I, I so wasn't the there when past, peacocks came into being. Evolved, was it created? We don't know. And so, That's yeah. Right. Okay. In the case of the peacock's feathers, we can observe in nature today sexual selection, which is when an animal chooses a mate based generally on phenotypic extravagance. Among cichlids, a type of fish, experiments have been done that show with a lack of predators in the environment, females will select more and more colorful males through time. When there are predators in the environment, however, there is a threshold that male cichlids can reach in color, which also probably holds true for peacocks. So all we have to do is observe peafowls choosing peacocks based on feather colors, and they do. Then, we can simply extrapolate backwards based on our observations until we reach a conclusion that's supported by the evidence. In science, we want to be able to extrapolate backwards and forwards based on our given data, and this is how we learn a lot of things. It would almost seem the creationists are arguing that we can't use evidence to think forwards or backwards, but unless evidence shows that the laws of physics are in flux, the creationists are wrong. Lastly, they end this segment in a very strange way. They say they don't know if peacocks evolved or were created. Well, if they're unsure, then why do they identify as creationists and work for a creationist organization? If they don't know, then why are they involved with the group that proclaims peacocks were created? Do they honestly think that peacocks were just created by God for biodiversity's sake? Or God created peacocks so they would just look pretty to humans? That's very childish. Okay. If, if I said, well, how old is this dinosaur bone? Well, you're looking at the bone, it's in your hand. Okay, so you've got the facts. Yes, I'm looking at you've a got fact. The fact. You could be an evolutionist or a creationist, doesn't yep, matter. You're holding a, a dinosaur. There's a bone here in here. There's or, or, a bone. Look at that bone. Yeah. So How old is it? How old is it? Is it it's historical, historical science. That's right. <laughs> right? It's yeah. not, hopefully this is not difficult as we, as we go through this. Yeah. It seems tremendously difficult for evolutionists Sometimes to Sometimes you're this talking to somehow. people, they just... No, it's about science, and we're on about science, and we're, yeah. we're going we're gonna to go where the facts take us. Well, yeah. slow down there. Um, yeah. We can think of some other ones. How long ago did Neanderthals exist? The example about the age of a dinosaur fossil doesn't support the creationists, because if creationism were true, then we'd expect all prehistoric animals to be scattered about in the rocks without order. However, that isn't what we find. Instead, organisms are in discrete geologic layers, the order of which has been determined through careful calculations by physicists and chemists. Using radiometric dating to determine the age of fossils gives a very interesting result. Using multiple types of radiometric dating, that are of the correct half-life of course, gives pretty much the same answer to the same fossil. When radiometric dating is used appropriately, it dates fossils pretty accurately, although within a margin of error, which never gives credence to creationism. Second, I'm not impressed with these guys, who obviously aren't scientists, belittling the scientific method and saying that the only things we can't observe directly are interpretations. I'd argue that everything we sense involves interpretation by our brain, which itself is imperfect. No one sees the exact same color scheme because of the different biochemistry in people's brains. So would they really claim observation is perfect? Third, Neanderthals have been dated to a specific time period, which again disproves the notion of creationism. So what did amphibians evolve from? Amphibians evolved from lobe fin fish, and biologists know this because amphibian DNA, yes, the same thing that humans use to solve murder cases, ties them to fish. DNA doesn't lie, and it's how we know that we're related to elephants, oak trees, penicillin, bacteria, and every other organism. Morphology or anatomy and physiology also show that amphibians are related to fish. Notice that both of the things I've mentioned have nothing to do with going into the past, although the fossil record can even shed light on the question. The relevant area of history is called Romer's Gap, even though it isn't much of a gap anymore. Now the video moves on to a new guest. Darwinism is science insofar as it is used at the level at which it really works empirically, and that's the micro level. The creation organization that made this video couldn't even get a biologist to comment on how evolution works. Would that be because biologists know how evolution works? Very curious if you ask me. Anyways, saying that evolution only works in the quote micro level is disingenuous because it tells us nothing about what the micro level even is. Allow me to supply the definition. Microevolution is evolution below the level of species, and macroevolution is evolution at or above the level of species. Both have been validated beyond reasonable doubt. Examples of the former are breeds of plants and animals, and the latter are cichlids, finches, mosquitoes, etc. Darwinism is a scientific explanation for why you get offshore island species 
that differ somewhat from species on the mainland. The lawyer says biogeography supports creationism when in fact it does the exact opposite. The reason is that biogeography shows a global flood could never have occurred because certain organisms and fossils are only ever found in certain places. For example, there are no kangaroos in the Middle East or Asia, which we would expect if kangaroos got off Noah's Ark. The second problem is that we wouldn't be able to figure out which organisms were directly created by God and which evolved afterwards. That is quite a dilemma. But when you take that evidence and you say, and that tells us how we got trees and moths and birds and scientific observers in the first place, that's pure philosophy. What he's saying is that extrapolating backwards based on the vast amount of evidence that we currently have is philosophy. Of course, that's what I'd expect to hear from someone whose degree isn't at all in biology. Because the vast amount of biologists accept evolution, creationists are left to find supporters among lawyers, dentists, and engineers who have no authority in evolutionary biology whatsoever. This lawyer has no clue how extensive the fossil record is or how good genetics is at tying together species. The irony in this slide is overflowing. For centuries, Western people were indoctrinated into Christianity and killed if they disagreed. And now the creationists have the audacity to claim that people taught facts gathered through the empirical scientific method are brainwashed? Now, the video moves on to Dr. Richard Lunston. Last month, you taught how mutations were genetic disasters. How, by natural selection, can they randomly produce new and better structures? That's a good question. Good question. I'll probably have to think more about that. Okay, well, aren't the odds of the random assembly of genes mathematically impossible? This doctor, Richard Lumsden, has been paraded around on creationist websites because he was an atheist parasitologist who became a creationist Christian. Certainly, he's entitled to his own opinions, and my interest is the facts, not his opinions. Next, if he honestly taught that wholly deleterious mutations along with natural selection lead to speciation, then he doesn't understand evolution. Evolution is about mutations that allow the survival and reproduction of a population building up over time through natural selection. Third, the argument about how probable or improbable each person's distinct set of genes would arise is pointless. The improbability of everyone's genes appearing in the order that they are is so negligible that it isn't worth considering. However, this isn't an argument against evolution. When you consider everyday activities, everything you do is so vastly improbable that the odds of you doing anything is virtually zero. Heck, the odds that you listen to me at this time are virtually zero. Does that mean you listening to me is impossible? No, of course not. Zoologist Richard Dawkins wrote a book titled Climbing Mountain Probable in which he deals with creationist arguments concerning the probability of evolutionary changes. I would recommend the read. Where exactly in the fossil record is the evidence for progressive evolution? The transitional forms between the major groups? This is probably a reference to the age-old creationist quote mine from paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould in which he said that fossilized taxa appear in many cases without preceding species, genera, or families. The reason for this is that only a very minute portion of all organisms are fossilized, and if all organisms were to be fossilized, then we'd be up to our ears and bones. We do, however, have a large enough collection of fossils to make a very good history of evolution. Dr. Gould was even later quoted as saying, quote, It is infuriating to be quoted again and again by creationists, whether through design or stupidity, I do not know, as admitting that the fossil record includes no transitional forms. Transitional forms are generally lacking at the species level, but they are abundant between larger groups. End quote. I dislike using the term, quote, transitional form, because all organisms that reproduce are genetic transitions between their parent and offspring generations. Essentially, because this professor of parasitology is ignorant of the facts of evolutionary biology, the entire subject of evolution is wrong. Good job, you win the prize. Speaking of prize, sorry guys, we didn't win creationist bingo this time. All in all, this video is dismal, and I don't think there's much hope for the remaining 36 videos. Join me next time for part 2 of this series titled Definitions and Darwin's Finches. Until then, thanks for watching. I'll see you later.